Amen. That was fire right there. Man, we could have just uh, took up another offering and went on home. Amen. <laughs> nah, joke. The guests are like, oh, snap, that church. No, nah, no, nah, we're not like that. We're about to get in the word of God. That's what we're about to do. Open up the scripture. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, I want to unpack this relatively quicker. Um, uh, I want to talk about the subject of the dynamics of being a disciple of Jesus. So uh, what does that look like? The word disciple is, is loosely used and thrown around in our culture today. Uh, and so, but with that said, I think there's several reasons. I think there's a lack of um, clarity within the church on what discipleship really is. But then I think also, I think the pressure from the culture has caused many to moonwalk to Michael Jackson in their walk with Jesus. It's called them to kind of tr tread back. The pressure is too, too much. And I don't want to be found out of being a Christian. I don't want to uh, wrong anybody. I don't want to um, impose on somebody else's religious beliefs. And that's kind of where we're at as a culture. So what I'm going to talk about this morning is, man, just the dynamics of being a disciple in the midst of a very godlessness culture. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is the context. Paul is encouraging Timothy, the young pastor. He's discipling him and he's telling him, hey, look, man, there's going to be some serious uh, godlessness, if you will, godlessness in the culture um, as you see it, as you pastor. Starting in verse 1, he says, but understand this, in the last days, there will be times of difficulty. Everybody circle difficulty. If you are hearing a preacher or a teacher or a podcast individual tell you that Christians will not suffer, turn it off. I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you like it's like grandma should say, boy, shut the door. Turn it off. For people will be lovers of sales, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. I understand what that's like. Amen. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpeasable, slanderers, if you will, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, keeps going, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of good of God, having the appearance, this is key, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, he says. He says, avoid, avoid them. For among them are those who creep into the households. He gives us a little dynamic and take over and capture weak women. And then he drops in, uh, verse 7, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Always around the Bible, always around uh, scripture, always reading, always frequenting the church or the temple or, or teaching a class, always around the Bible. But being around the Bible and being on the periphery of Christianity will not help you live a life that's a dynamic discipleship matter. As a matter of fact, it's going to cause you to moonwalk all the way through. And you'll stand before Jesus one day and be like, my gosh, I should have, I should have leaned in, man. I should have, man, God gave me some recipes. And that's what Paul is going to give to Timothy today. He's going to say, young lad, you're going to pastor in the area of Ephesus. Uh, there's going to be older people in the congregation. You're younger. He tells them in um, the first uh, Timothy, he tells them, hey, look, don't let them look down upon you. Send them an example. Send them an example. But here he goes, I'm going to give you an example. This is pretty cool to watch. So out of the gate, we, we want to see something. Verse 10, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. The dynamics of living in a pressurous culture, right? So who's in your life? Just if you're taking notes, ask yourself this question. Who's in your life? My stepdad used to tell me this, Marcus, you're guilty by what? Associations, associations right? Guilty. What you talking about? I'm good. No, you're guilty by association, son. Show me your friends, I'll show you what? Future. Your future. So Paul is going to tell him in verse 10, you got to make sure you have the right people in your life. And don't you know, I'm going to tell you sometime, man, sometimes the wrong people in your life. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. Some of us, we need to learn how to unfriend some folk. I did say that. Because Paul was saying, Romans, bad company corrupts what? Good character. Depends on your translation. I heard different translations out there. All right. But who's in your life? Check this out. He says, based on the previous context, one through nine, 
and he drops the names of some people. He says, hey, but, but you though, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, watch this, my persecutions, you've seen it, and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch and all these other places, watch this, watch this, which persecutions I've endured. He says, I've endured them, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. This is not popular in our culture today. As a matter of fact, most people want to come, and this is the whole context here, where they will raise up for themselves. In the next chapter, chapter 4, they will raise up for themselves preachers and teachers that will tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. That's where we're at today as a, as a church. Not in here, but I'm talking about at, at large, around the world. Pastors telling people what they want to hear. It's all about you. You're the, you're the center of your own world. Every sermon is about you. No, it's not. No, 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 it's not. Every sermon is not about you. And then the, the Bible is, is, is for you and for me, but it's not about us. The Bible is about Jesus. That, that, hope that lands. But he says, you will though. This is not any guessing. This is not, you know, this, this random stuff that's being taught up there. And I said, no, you will suffer persecution. The question is, how close are you to Jesus? Are you moonwalking? Because if you're moonwalking, you're not going to really be persecuted. But if you're close to Jesus, you better rest assured, you will suffer, you will suffer persecution. He says, while evil people are in, in you know, imposters, they will go on. This is kind of what the psalmist was always crying about, them in peccatory prayers uh, or psalms to the Lord. Lord, you're worthy, you're holy, may your great majesty comes from you. You're my refuge, you're my shield. Kill them, right? You know what I mean? Those are called peccatory prayers. So this is, it seems, he said, why are they advancing and prospering and, and but yet I'm over here struggling? That's what he's saying. But God is going, no, 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 no. Uh, God will not be mocked. It may assume that the culture is advancing and doing good, but really they're going from bad to what? Worse. To worse. Deceiving. Oh, and being what? You see this text unfolding? So here's the deal. He says, out of the gate, what you need to do is this. You need to have somebody in your life. Who's in your life? Who's in your life? And then Paul says that um, this person, whoever they may be, could be a hero in the faith, could be a mom, could be a dad, grandparent. It could be a teacher. But a godly in individual who patterns their life. Here's the whole thing about discipleship. It's a person who patterns their life after the steps of Jesus. It's not merely information. It's not merely just a whole bunch of head knowledge. But the dynamics of what it looks like to be a true disciple, it is to literally, how, as hard as it may get, I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I'm still, I'm trusting, I'm patterning my life after Jesus. Now, what I'm going to say about that is, he gives some qualifications or some, some characteristics of this individual. He said, young Timothy, let me tell you something. You, you've seen me. You spent time with me. He says, however, follow, you follow my teachings. I've always taught the truth, young man. You ought to do the same. I've always taught the truth. He says, you see my conduct. You see my aim in life. I've always pointed people to Jesus. I'm not perfect, young man, but, but here it is. You've seen me. I'm in your life. But not only that, he says, you see my faith. But what's interesting how faith is placed. My faith, then he says my patience, but then he says my love, and then my steadfastness. Why is that, that, that lineup interesting? Why? Because my aim, he said his aim is to give glory to God. Is your aim in life to give glory to God? Is it? Come on, that, was a, that was a little small little mm, right? Do you, want, do you want to give glory to God? Here's how you give glory to God, when the fruit of the Spirit is starting to come forth out of your life. But Paul says, my aim has always been to give glory to God. My faith, if you go back in Acts, you can see where Paul was preaching multiple times and he was being beat in one town for preaching the gospel, kicked out of the town, and then the text says his back was exposed, literally uh, whipped and exposed and the flesh hanging. I don't want to scare you all too much, but, but here it is. But he would go to the next town preaching the gospel. 
Like this is this is the reality of real biblical Christianity. I, I don't know if I would do it. Well, would you do it? But what happens is, if we have a relationship with Jesus, he gives us the power and the unction and compellingness to do it, but also, it's always encouraging to see somebody else walk through it. To model what it looks like to face persecution, to model what it looks like to go through hard times. Who's in your life? So here it is, he says, man, I I went through, walked through the gates and started preaching the gospel again. It's amazing in our culture, man. I'm, I'm talking about myself too. Man, the, even the, the whisper, the shadow of persecution or opposition, we moonwalking. And my job, if I say something about Jesus, I may lose my job or not get a promotion. At school, if I say something about the master, the one I'm at to stand before one day and give an account for all that I've done and how I leveraged Jesus and the gospel in my school, if I, if I say something, I'm going to... In my neighborhood, man if, I, man, if they know I'm a Christian, man, I'm gonna like, I got to turn the music off whatever I'm bumping before I get in the hood. Amen, right? Lord forbid they hear what I'm playing. No, 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 no. Man, man, we are all, we are all really, if you know this or not, we're all on display and we're modeling something. So Paul says, who's in your life? Let me just say this. This whole dynamic of discipleship, living in a times where it's pressurous, where Christians are seen as bigots and unloving and and behind the times, it's hard to be a Christian in our culture today. But regardless of that, regardless of the tension, we know this was going to come. Jesus declared it in Matthew 24, 25, and and the rest in 26. But but besides the pressure, we, we know the times are getting even worse. In this context, 1 Timothy 3, Paul was saying it was bad here. How much worse and how much has it progressed from this context to 2024? Think of this. But regardless of the times, the Bible says we still have a responsibility and a role to play. They say, I was talking stats earlier in the back. Stats are interesting because most stats are made up right on the spot. Y'all know that? But, but they say, God bless you. Amen. So this, we're one big family. Amen. You sneeze, we say bless you. Amen. But, 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 but stats, show, stats show that one in four people in America identify as Christians. What's interesting, because I had a conversation even last night about something like this, it's like, well, I could be a Christian and still do what I want to do. If you have real people in your life that love Jesus, that their aim is to glorify Jesus, their aim is to model Jesus, if that's their aim and they, 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 they're exuding or exemplifying, if you will, those characteristics that Paul used in this context in verses 10, 11, and 12, if, if that's the person and you're living a life of just hellness, they're going to call you out. Who's in your life? And so the stats will go on to say this, that actually there's a growing number of people that identify as this. None. I'm not a Christian. I'm not agnostic. I'm not anything. I'm me. Do research. I'm, a, I'm in the none. This is a rising deal. Do you know that church attendance is declining? You know, Christianity is declining in America for sure, but it's rising in Africa and in China like crazy. Parts of Asia as well. Paul is saying, who's in your life? How is... How are you going to be able to model what it looks like to live a life under pressure? Because it's a matter of living under pressure. What really, what's in you is going to come out. And what's not in you actually is going to come out. I think this, this, this revealed a lot of what was in people. Twomp, twomp. It's going back hood on you. Twomp on it. 2020. Because what was in, we thought, had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. There was a lack of discipleship. Can we go there? There was a lack of just commitment to the church. There was a lack of, as Paul is going to say, stay rooted in the sacred scriptures. There was a lack of standing on the promises of God. There was just a lack of. And so you wonder if there's a lot of shaft, if you will, Christians, and not enough weak Christians. 
You wonder if there's a lot of goats, if you will, in the culture, but not enough sheep in the fold of God. We just wonder this. I mean, and it actually played out before all of our eyes. We all know people that we thought we knew, but then 2020 happened and they bounced on us. Anybody got anybody you know? Come on. Anybody? I'm the only one? Amen. Y'all can lie in church. (laughs) You got to deal with the Lord later. Paul says, who's in your life? It's like a Bible study. You say, Pastor, you're all over the place. No, I'm not. It's like a Bible study. Who's in your life? <laughs> Who's helping you model what it looks like? Don't you know you're always, you're always learning? We never stop learning. I, I would be surprised if, if somebody followed you around all, all week long for 24 hours a day what would they find? Would they see you yelling at your kids? Can I keep it real with you? Will will they see you verbally abusing your wife? Will they see you looking at pornography? Like what? Will they see you cutting the corner on your taxes and cutting the corner in the job? What were they going to see? Paul is saying, We're all learning and being taught by something. It's not a matter of if I'm a disciple. The question is, who's discipling me? Most of us in this room, you're being discipled by Fox News. I'm going there. Yeah. Fox News is your your spiritual food. Some of you are being, you know, CNN News. And you, you hold it as infallible. You hold it as, and actually hold it higher than the word of God. And here Paul is saying, Timothy, let me tell you something. The culture is changing. It's shifting very rapidly. It's shifting very fast. And you got to make sure that you model what I've modeled for you. 2 Timothy 2 and 2, what you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. You heard me say this. And not only heard me, you watched me. Here's what I want you to do. You need to go and do the same thing, son. In church, he's telling us to do the same thing because here's why. Uh, Self-centered Christians who serve the Lord half-heartedly seldomly have to pay a price for their faith. They are, they are of little threat to Satan's work because they are little benefit to Christ. Paul says, model my life, but you will suffer though. None of us like to suffer. Anybody like to suffer? Anybody like, sign me up. Mandy showed me a funny video this week. Uh, the, the disciples, the hoax of the, the resurrection. Y'all seen that deal? I'm butchering it. What's the name of it, babe? The hoax? Oh, she's like, don't put me on the spot. So they show, I don't know. We showed me the video. So, yeah. so the hoax of the disciples, right? And they, they were talking about how, <laughs> why you funny mud? So they were talking about um, how, what would it have been like to pull a hoax on the resurrection? And they were all together. It's comical. It's major funny. And they were talking about, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so here's what we're going to do. Had a committee, had a little fire going, and Peter's talking. He's going, yeah, so here's what we're going to do. We're going uh, to steal the body, right? And everybody's like, oh, right? They had the dude running by like this. Oh, I mean, it's funny. You got to watch it. And then he said, so what's the end result? The end result is this. We're going to be persecuted for the rest of our lives, right? And everybody's like, hey, whoa. And then, then Thomas is like, man, hold on. I'm doubting over here. What's going on? But here's the point. Here's the deal. It was irony in the sense of that's how the culture kind of looks at Christians. Church, hear me say this. If you smell like Jesus, you're going to get persecuted like him. If you identify with the master, you will suffer something. And I want to talk about the doctrine of prosperity and, and the, the vow to poverty. I'm going to deal with that just a little bit. But, but, but here's the deal. No, man, we, we have to identify with him. Because there's a teaching out there that proclaims that if you have enough faith, you won't suffer. Have enough faith. I remember, Mandy, we had our first miscarriage. People we loved and knew in the church in, in Chicago told us, man, y'all didn't have enough faith. It was years ago, before my, ba- my baby girl, Sarai. She's 12 now. Before, I remember that. Like that, that stuck, with, it's sticking, it's, it's there. Oh, y'all didn't have enough faith. Whoa. That sent us in a hole. 
Start questioning. But here's the deal. It, it's, there's this teaching out there like, well, man, I'm, I'm holy. I, I, I go to church. I mean, I don't suffer. I mean, I, why did I get cancer? Why did this happen? No, no, no. Him, the result of you getting something is not based on God's, un, him not being good. So it's a, it's a product of the fallen world that we live in. Everything has been tainted by sin. Our bodies, the culture, even the beauty of Niagara Falls, everything still has been tainted by sin. And so until Jesus gets back, then comes back, then everything will be set right. But here it is. There's this teaching out there. Be careful. Here's what Paul tells him secondly. He said, man, indeed, you better trust this. That if you desire, I like that word desire. It's a choice. Y'all see that in your Bibles? If you desire, you got a choice, though. But if you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, not a cultural Christianity or Jesus, not a political Jesus, not an American Jesus, not a black Jesus or a white Jesus or whatever, however you want to coin him, but a biblical Christ, a biblical Jesus, you will suffer persecution. So what do I do then? What do I do then, Paul? Well, you trust the purity and the power of the gospel. You don't, you don't, you don't shift. You don't, don't shift. It's amazing because Paul would say this quite often that some people started out with him. Actually, in the back end of uh, 2 Timothy, he calls people out. He said, like, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Demas, do your best to come to me soon. Verse 10, uh, chapter 4 and verse 10, he says, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone through Thessalonica. So they started with Paul, but they left the sacred teachings. Look what Paul says to him. Look at verse 14 in our chapter, verse uh, chapter 3. But as for you, he says again, continue in what you have learned. You see the language? And have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and from how childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He said, man, you got you to get in the word. Don't try to change it. It's so easy to be in the midst of things and try to change it and tweak it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? In the midst of seasons, you're like, well, let me add a little bit of meat to this. Let me add a little bit of this. No, 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 no. This culture is, I'm telling you, there's some sick stuff out there. Syncretism is one of them. It's trying to pull you away from the sacred scriptures. Here it is. Separatism is another one. Well, I'm just going to separate myself from the culture so much that I won't be tainted by the culture. I'm going to cancel the culture. I am going there, guys. The more I pass it, the, the older I get, I'm just going to be, hey, we're going to drop it like it's hot. Hey, Amen. Easy believism. I just come to church and I just kind of like, be, I can just be associated and I'm, I'm, I'm good. No, man, you better make sure you align with the Lord. The hero complex, we're seeing this happen day after day. People think they're the savior and not surrendering to the master. Domesticated grace, which is called a cheat grace. I believe um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it. He said this way. He said, a, a Christianity without Christ is no Christianity at all. It's cheap grace, or Augustine said it. It's cheap, it's cheap grace. It's a domesticated grace. Here's one that I think we all know about, individualism. Me and I can do it. Anybody ever been there? Paul says, don't drift. Remember the sacred scriptures. Remember what you believe. Remember when the seed of the gospel was planted in you. Y'all remember those days? Y'all remember? What, throw me a life verse. Um, any, it's just one life verse. Come on, somebody throw one out to me. Matthew 6, Man, ready. Matthew 6, 33. Boom. I wasn't say, what does it say? I'm not going to do that. But, be, but, but here's the deal. When you first heard that text, when you, when you study that, God met you in that season for a specific reason, for a specific time. But that was back in the day. But though it was back in the day, Steve, it doesn't negate the fact that the word is still valid today. So it's amazing how sometimes in life what we do is, myself included, is we think that, well, well, that was, I heard that back in the day. I studied that word back in the day. I know God is, I knew he was good here, but I'm not going to trust that he's good here. I knew that he was faithful here, but I'm going to try to figure some other stuff out here on this end. No, Paul is saying, hey, look, Timothy, do not try to rationalize. Remember what you learned. Remember the sacred teachings that you taught or you were learned. Why? Because... In that particular season, when it happens, when it comes about, man, you're going to know. God's going to make it come to light. It's going to be fresh right before your eyes. 
Well, it's another dynamic is this because you, um, James says this, a lot of times Christians are just hearers of the word and not doers. And I'd be a fool and remiss to think that everybody in this, this congregation or even watch it online, you, you apply the word on a regular basis. I don't apply it all the time. But what Paul is echoing is similar to what James is saying. Don't, don't, don't just be a hearer. Don't be a hearer. Be a doer. Apply it. It's going to hurt, but apply it. It's not about me. I need to surrender. Try it. I need to forgive somebody. Try it. I need to actually show agapao love, verb form, unconditional love. Try it. I need to give up some stuff in my life and really put Jesus as the king and not my own career. Try it. God is calling some of y'all to ministry right now. I'm telling you right now, and you've been pushing. We're going to talk about Jonah next week. It's going to be fire, by the way. And y'all been pushing God back, and God is going, no, no, no. Will you trust my voice? Try it. Here it is. Don't be here. Be a doer. Paul tells him, man, Scripture is able to make you wise for salvation, but it's through faith. It's this firm persuasion, faith. He uses this word faith, firm persuasion. Nothing's, don't be persuaded, son. I love, I love what Corey Ten Boone said. She said it this way in regards to God's promises and not being swayed in the midst of persecution and staring opposition and all that stuff in the face. face. She said this, I've experienced his presence in the deepest hell that man can create. I have tested the promises of God. The Bible, she says, and believe me, the Bible, you can count on it. It's always reliable. So Paul is saying in a shifty culture, the word ain't shifty. You can always rely on scripture. But then lastly, he says this, well, here's the deal, man, I'm gonna tell you something. You got, we need to be... <laughs> This is not original with me, but we need to be this. Y'all ready? We need to be, if you want to overcome or endure hardships, be a word over world. I struggle with that one. Over world believer. So in other words, getting the word first. What's feeding you? Can I be honest? It's so tempting, man, to get up in the morning and just look at, look at Instagram. Can we be honest? It's funny, when I'm, I'm supposed to be doing something, Mandy, she'll get on and she'll see that I'm on, I'm active. She'll be like, hi, I thought you were studying. I'm supposed to be studying. So she know accountability built in. Love it. Hi, what you doing? And uh, what you doing? Oh, oh. Right? So, but, 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 but word before world. Paul is saying, you got to get in the word, though. You got to get in scripture. The gospel still works. Notice what he says in verse 14. But as for you, again, he says, continue in what you have learned and what firmly you believe, knowing what, uh, from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Something about the promises of God. Because a lot of times they don't make any sense when you hear them, but you get yourself, you find yourself in a real valley. You find yourself in a real dark season. And those promises, they'll start making a little bit more sense. He says, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But here's why. You got to hold on to the purity of the gospel. He says, all scriptures breathed out by God. All of it. Every single word. Every jot and tittle. There's an argument out there that's saying that portions of scripture is inspired and, and some is not. That's false. Everything that's in this book is inspired by the Lord. And this is what's known as the doctrine of inspiration. And basically that means it's the refer, refers to the process of God by which God oversaw, oversaw the composition of scripture guiding the writers to write exactly what he wanted them to write without error. So all scripture, all of it, all of scripture, all means all and that's all, all means. All of it, the whole counsel of God. Paul is saying, Model my life, hold on to the sacred teachings, but you, son, you got you to gotta make sure you get in the word before the world gets you. Because all of scripture is good. And if all scripture is good and breathed out by God, guess what? It's able to do something. And he tells us what it's able to do. He says, well, it is able to, look at this, verse 16. He says, it's able to teach you. 
for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So here's what he's saying. You got to be a student of the word. You got to get in the word. Second Peter would even say this in regards to this argument of who wrote the word and some pieces were lost as influenced by man's intellect and other stuff. Let me, let me just, Second Peter would say this in 121, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. You got these boys were chosen by God to write on different continents over a span of 2,000 some odd, 1,500 years. None of them got together and consulted with one another. And every single one point to Jesus. Every book that was written. There's no contradiction. There's no error. So here, you and I, what we ought to do is put down the other things. This, here's how we're going to make it. I'm telling you guys, it may not make sense now, but you, you let somebody like Columbine, you let somebody walk up to you and say, do you believe in Jesus? Most of us, we may try to moonwalk back. We may try to, she said, yes. Pow. What, 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 what would give her a spine like that? With pressure. Well, she, this wasn't just a tool, it was a treasure. All scriptures breathed out by God. I love this idea by breathe. It means invested. It means close, knitted. It means uh, through and through. Intimacy. It's like when God created Adam. Can you imagine? Just dirt. He was just dirt. Erected from the earth. Dirt. Standing there. No life. No vigor. And the Bible says, not pneuma in the New Testament, but ruach, in the Hebrew, that God breathed into his nostrils. Look at this. He was close. <sighs> and Adam became a, a living being, gave life to him. Have you ever thought about this? What was Adam's first thoughts when he, when he was able to see and process? Have you ever thought about that? Most of us are like, no, never thought of it. Right? That's how I think. <laughs> like, what would you, what, what? Like before the fall too, Stan Stones, like what? It was gorgeous. But what tells me about that whole idea, and then you think of scripture, is that God is intimately connected with scripture. So when you and I study scripture, we don't study scripture just for the sake of studying scripture. We study scripture to understand the mission of God. We understand, we study scripture, all of it, because it's, it's profitable and it's actually able to do multiple things, but we study scripture so that we can make it and be sustained in this pressurous culture. Why? So that we can hear the voice of God. Somebody once said, you want to hear God speak? Read your Bible. Somebody else said, hey, look, you want to hear God speak audibly? Read your Bible out loud. We study all of this, the full counsel of the word, of the Bible, because we want to know the heart of God. We see the face of God. We discover the plan and purpose of God for the world and even for your life, all in the process of being transformed. Well, it's amazing because you think about the Bible, the Bible is the most sold book of all time. Did y'all know that? Do you know in 9-11 when that popped off, in September 9-11, um, the Bible and even church attendance skyrocketed. There was something... Uh, about humans where we realize that this thing is out of our control. I'm not in control. But what's interesting that maybe in that moment, some people thought, well, eh, they kind of belittled the Bible, but the Bible, it was to the point skyrocketed the sales. They were looking for something. In a, in a shifting culture, in a pressurous culture, they were, they were going to the word. It was something that drove people to the scripture. So not only was it the most sold book and still even the most sold book, here's a funny one. Do you know that the Bible is the most stolen book in all the world? It gets stolen the most more than any book in the USA. That's like when somebody breaking your car and you have your favorite Bible in there, you're like, it's like lambskin, it was like $200 and they steal your car and you're like, all right, well, Lord, I hope they read um, you know, John 3.16 and get saved, amen, right? It's the most stolen book in all of the Bible, I mean the world. Do you know this? It's the most translated book. Do you realize that in China, China's the world's largest producers of Bibles. 
Yes, today. It's true. We think everything's about America. They're sending missionaries here. But this is God's country, though, right? I think there's a shifting of what it looks like to really be a Christian. I wish I had more time to unpack this at a seminar. It's a false image. Church, hear me say this. Make sure you stay close to the word of God. And not just study the Bible. We don't study the Bible just to study the Bible. We study the Bible so we can meet the God of the Bible and be transformed. Well, this book, the Bible, has impacted more cultures than any other book. If you don't have a physical copy, we will get you one today. Hey, you got your phone, bless you, I'll pray for you. But it's hard, man. You get you know, notifications, something pop up. Man, it's hard. Get a physical copy. Write in it. Interact with the Bible. It's not archaic. As a matter of fact, Charlie Dates, one of my buddies, he said this, man, the Bible is more relevant than tomorrow's newspaper. Try it. Well, Paul says, here's the end goal, Timothy. That you may be complete. So the irony is, if you're not in Scripture and studying Scripture, you're incomplete. If, you're not, if you don't have a healthy dose of Scripture, you're incomplete. If something is, something is off, it will be off. But he says the purpose of the scripture is to do multiple things. But he says in closing, it may make you complete, but equipped for every good work. Amen. Equipped, ready. When I need to forgive somebody, I'm equipped to do it. I don't have to try to pull myself up from my own bootstraps. If I need to love somebody, I'm equipped to do it. If I got to share my faith in the midst of a, a, a toxic culture, I'm equipped to do it. If I have to walk with somebody through, through and bearing their burden and I really want to, I don't want to get in this mess, I'm equipped to do it. If I need to serve and I feel so inadequate, I'm equipped to actually do it. Yeah. Yeah. If I need to live on mission and, and I don't know what this looks like, well, you know what, God, you've equipped me to do it because I've been in the word. I've seen the God of missions. I've seen God's mission. I've seen the heart of God and his missions. It's to reach every single people and person group. You'd be, you'd be equipped to do it. What about this one? Man, I, I, can't, I can't shake this sin. You equipped to do it. D.O. Moody said this in closing. He said, either the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. It's a, it's a reality. 